Okay, let's do a, a short demonstration of the first three parts of the Bent Creek Trails and Analysis Project. Notice there are a bunch of learning resources up here that cover georeferencing and creating data. I'm going to cover some of the things in this PowerPoint and video, as well as some of the things in these uh, Esri uh, ArcGIS resource and, and uh, help center uh, help area portions of their website here. Uh, throughout this video. There's also this video here that is a video of the entire project from start to finish. <coughs> it's a little bit old. It was done a few years ago, so this video um, will be a supplement to that and maybe, a, maybe an update for that as well. So when you read the summary of this, it, it essentially indicates that for every GIS project you work with, you create a, a project working directory structure, and you always start off with some existing data you usually have to create some data, maybe process some data, and uh, this, uh, this demonstration will walk through some of this. So in the very first part of the project, we ask you to create a directory structure for doing this work. I'm going to make a, a folder called Bent Creek, and inside of that folder, I'm going to make a few folders, and I'm going to call one documentation. I'm going to call one map export. I'm going to call one MXDs. Whether you use capitals or not is up to you. And I'll call one shape files. Pretty much every GIS project I have, I've got these folders. And then as I work through the project, sometimes I end up with several other folders. Um, but I almost always have at least this set of folders. And so from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download this Bent Creek data. It goes to my downloads folder. I'll also grab this DWQ classifications that's a big file and this Buncombe Hillshade model. So while those download, the, uh, the Bent Creek data probably downloaded the quickest there. And this is some existing data just for Bent Creek. Now I'm going to double click this zip file and it, uh, it ex opens up in 7-zip. If you don't have 7-zip loaded, yours is going to work a little bit different. But notice there are some shape files in here. Those right there make up two shape files, one with Bent Creek Roads and one with the Bent Creek Boundary. We've also got a text file with some openings, and we've got a trail map in here that's just a JPEG. So I'm going to click Extract of these, and I'm going to browse over to my Bent Creek folder where I've got this shape files folder. And I'm going to dump them all into the shapefiles folder. Sorry about that. This text file is not a shapefile, and this JPEG is not a shapefile, so I may reorganize those a little bit over here once I get to my uh, once I get to my Bent Creek folder. So if you look in the shapefiles folder now, I had I had that Bent Creek JPEG selected, so that should not have that's not exactly what we needed to do. Let's go back to our downloads and let's extract this again. So I had that selected when I extracted. So it only ex extracted the one file. If I unselect it, it'll extract everything. Again, back to my shapefiles folder. Let it roll. It just wants to replace that one. I'll just tell it not to. And now in my Bent Creek shapefiles folder, I've got a bunch of files. Now I don't tell you to do this in this uh, in this exercise, but um, there are some other files in here that are not shape files. This text file is not a shape file. It's a text file. So I'm going to make a folder for, for that, maybe call it something like other files, other files. And I'm going to copy that text file over to it since it's not a shape file. I'll cut it out of here and I'll paste it into here. And I'm also going to make a folder called the trail map. And this is a United States Forest Service trail map, USFS trail map. And this trail map has the, the, uh, the trails on it. And this is just a JPEG of Bent Creek. Okay, So <coughs> when I first started doing this project, I did not have access to any trails data for Bent Creek. And so we use this map to digitize the trails to create a GIS layer. We've done heads up digitizing in this class where we digitize buildings on aerial photographs, right? Digitize 
heads up on top of an aerial photograph. Aerial photographs have coordinates stored with them. So when you create data digitizing on top of a aerial photograph, the data you input has coordinates. This map is just a JPEG. There's no coordinates associated with it. So we're going to georeference this map to give it coordinates, and then we'll digitize the trails. So again, that's not a shape file, so that's not in the best folder. So I'm going to cut it out of that folder and create a folder, or it's already there, and paste it in there. So again, in the exercise, I didn't tell you to create these folders, but you should work hard to manage your data in a logical and effective manner that helps you to, to keep up with where things are. And organize them um, in folders that, that make sense. So I've got this data put in here. Um, I, I also downloaded a, let's move this over here and that. I also downloaded a DWQ classifications layer. This layer is the streams layer for all of North Carolina. So if I double click that, it's a shape file. I want to extract it to my shape files folder. Now we talked about this last class, DWQ classifications. This is really common when you get data from somewhere, you don't necessarily understand what the naming convention means. In this case, I can tell you what it means. DWQ stands for Division of Water Quality Classifications. It's the streams layer. It comes from DWQ. Okay, so the di Division of Water Quality. It's the streams layer. This is a Buncombe Hill shade. I'm going to extract it somewhere. Again, it doesn't, I don't have a folder for elevation data. This is a raster based data set. So I'm going to build a folder and I'm going to call it elevation data and I'm going to put this file in that elevation data folder. Okay, so we've been looking at this stuff, doing our unzipping, we've been using our file explorer. Remember that when you really start managing your GIS data, it's better to do it with Arc Catalog, and some of these layers will make a lot more sense if you look at them using Arc Catalog than using Windows Explorer. For instance, the elevation data is made up of all these files, but if we come here to our Documents folder using Arc Catalog instead of Windows Explorer, you'll see in my Bent Creek folder my elevation data. It actually, all of these files actually make up this one elevation file. Now, ArcMap is displaying this thing differently than it used to. The default symbol symbolize symbolization, the default way that this hill shade is symbolized should be a stretched a stretched grayscale symbol. And it's not doing that. And we'll see this in ArcMap and I'll show you how to change it. So that's just a little bit of uh, organizing data and kind of inventorying the data and looking around at it. As with any project, you should look around at some things like that's the Bent Creek boundary. There's the Bent Creek roads. Division of water quality is for the, the whole state. So the first thing we want to do is load these things into ArcMap and look at them. We did a little bit of previewing here in Arc Catalog. The instructions tell you to actually load it into ArcMap and look at it. We don't actually have to do that, but we can do it anyway. Let's look at the boundary here and the roads. I tell you specifically to load those two in first and then load in the division of water quality, the streams. And what that does is it ensures that your data frame comes in as state plane instead of coming in as the projection of the division water quality, which is also state plane, but in meters. The other data is state plane feet. So if you load all three at the same time, it can have uh, adverse effects and, and not set the coordinate system the way you'd like. All right, so here's our data. So our data comes with a streams layer. I'm going to symbolize it a little bit differently so you can kind of see the streams. 
and the roads. I don't want the roads to look blue. I think it's a little confusing. So that starts to look more like something you can you can understand a little bit. You've got the Bent Creek boundary. We've got roads in the Bent Creek boundary, and then we've got a streams layer for for uh, the whole state. So let's go on and save our map here. And before we do that, we want to go to our map document properties, and we want to look around here for a minute. Now, with the map document properties, you want to always store relative paths with your maps. Your maps will be able to be moved from system to system on a flash drive if you store relative paths. Remember that a map hard codes the location of where your data is. See, it's looking for this data on the C drive, in the users folder, documents, Bent Creek, shapefiles. So, with absolute paths stored, not relative, it looks on the C drive for this data. And so if you move this project folder, this whole Bent Creek folder, if you move it to a flash drive, this the E drive, and then it's no longer in the users folder, it would break the path to all the data if you don't store relative paths. Storing relative paths takes off that drive letter and it's, it looks for data relative to the project folder Bent Creek. It doesn't look on the C drive. That Bent Creek folder could be on the E drive or the F drive or anywhere. It makes your projects portable. So store relative paths. The other thing that we want to do in this project right off the bat, we need to create a geodatabase. Now, um, the instructions had you do this already, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was the first step to create a geodatabase. So I'm going to go into my documents folder and my Bent Creek folder, and I'm going to create a geodatabase here. Now, personally, I usually put my geodatabases right at the project level folder. I don't create another folder called geodatabase and put it in it. It's such a important database for every project that I think right there at the top level project folder is a good place for it to go. So in the Bent Creek folder, I'm going to create a new file geodatabase, and I'm going to call this thing Bent Creek with my last name Kennedy. We don't create personal geodatabases anymore. Those are the original kind of geodatabase, and they are um, dated. It's a legacy file format that we don't really use anymore. Create file geodatabases. If you have a basic license of ArcGIS, that's your only choice. If you have an advanced license, you can create these things called enterprise geodatabases, but that's an advanced topic. So we've got our, our geodatabase here, and so now I need to go back into my map document properties, <coughs> and I need to set my default geodatabase. Right now, it's going to output any data to this default.gdb, and I want it to look for my project database as the default database. So I'm going to go to there and tell it that my default database is now my project database. So that's another good setting to set. So for pretty much every project you have and map documents you have, you should store relative paths and you should set your default geodatabase to be a, a database you've built for the project. All right, so now we've got some things loaded in ArcMap, we've got a database, and we want to put our data into our database. And so we can store data in many different formats, but oftentimes we want to get the data into our geodatabase. So for the boundary and the roads, we could just right click and go to data and we could export the data directly to our database. And then it'll add it to the map. First, let's clip down the streams to this Bent Creek boundary so that we don't have streams for the whole state. We're working in Bent Creek. We don't need streams for the whole state. So this is a really common operation. We want to take the clip tool from our geoprocessing dropdown, 
You can get to this from Arc Toolbox as well. The, the most common to use processing task are right under this drop down. And we want to clip the input features are what we want to clip. And the clip features are what we want to clip by. And this is where we output the data to our database. So geoprocessing creates a new output data set. And because we specified our default geo database, it automatically dumps the data to that de default database. Now we're going to name it a little bit differently here. We're going to name it Bent Creek Streams. All right. And we'll let it add it to the map when it's done. So it just added it to the map. You can see it's green, so it looks a little bit different. But I can turn off this layer. And now I have just the streams in Bent Creek, and I do not need that entire statewide streams layer any longer. Now notice I've got one feature class, Bent Creek Streams, out of my geo database, but I've still got two shape files in here. I want all my data to be integrated into a database. So I'm going to right click my roads and I'm going to go to data and export data and I'm going to export all the features. It's going to take on the same coordinate system as our um, roads layer which is state plane feet. It's trying to dump it to a shape file. I don't want to do that. I want to tell it to go to a file or geo database, personal geo database feature class. And I'm going to go to my documents folder, to my Bent Creek folder, and there's my database. And this is going to be BC Roads. Now this is not clipping the data, it's just essentially making a copy of it. It's exporting it into my database. Yes, let's add it to the map. Now notice my roads are here in the database too, the source of this. So I've got roads in here from two places. I don't need the shapefile anymore. This is really common in a GIS project. When you're working in ArcGIS, the geo database is a nice central place to store all of your GIS data. It also allows you some advanced functionality. So in addition to it just giving you this nice central place to put all your data, it, it gives you advanced functionality that we'll learn about as we go. So let's go on and put our boundary in there too. I'm going to export it to our database. I'm going to call it BC boundary. And there it goes. Load it to the map. Yes. No fill color. I'm going to make it red outline a little bit thicker. And now my map is starting to look like this. I don't need this shape file anymore. I've got it loaded in my database and loaded in the map. And so now my map references data just in my geo database. Now, I could have created this database and exported those shape files to it without ever even loading those shape files in ArcMap. Now, it's kind of an additional step we did here, and a lot of times you load the data into ArcMap, your shape files, just to look at them, just to kind of inventory them and better understand them. But now we don't need them anymore. So, I'm going to save my map. Where should I save my map? I think the uh, Bent Creek folder has a MXD folder. So here's my MXD. I put in my MXD folder, call it Bent Creek, and we're off to the races. All right, now, the, uh, the streams layer. The streams layer is a little bit different than the rest of these layers. We typically strive to get all of our data in the same coordinate system. And the Bent Creek streams, while they are in state plane, they're in state plane meters. And meters and feet give you very different coordinates. In this case, this Bent Creek streams layer has projected on the fly to match my state plane feet data. So if we, uh, if you notice the numbers down there, 900,000 and 600,000, that's state plane feet around Bent Creek. If we go to our catalog and I look at my Bent Creek folder, notice that our catalog hadn't updated to show me my database. I'm going to press F5 to refresh. Remember, our catalog doesn't refresh very uh, quickly. If I look at my Bent Creek streams and I hover over it, look at the coordinates in the bottom right. 
those don't look like the same coordinates we were seeing in the map. Those are our state plane meters for Bent Creek. We're in state plane feet, so what we want to do now is we want to project that data from meters to feet. And that does several things. When you store data in a geo database, it automatically creates a field that keeps up with the length and area of lines and polygons. So it's important to understand that the, the unit that's stored in this field is based on the coordinate system units. So if you look at this shape length, that is the length of the streams in meters because they're stored in state plane meters. So it has implications throughout the data you're looking at within the database, how, how coordinates are, are stored, how analysis is done when you store your data in different coordinate systems. So let's project this data, this Bent Creek streams, to state plane feet. So I'm going to go to search here and search for the project tool. And there's projections, project data management. That's the one I want. Project coverage is an older tool. You can also project raster data. We want to project data management. And it wants the input feature class, Bent Creek Streams. Because that layer it has a defined coordinate system, it automatically fills that in. This is actually state plane North Carolina meters. We're going to output it to a file called bc underscore streams project to let you know it's projected. That's what the instructions tell you to call it. In reality, I'd often do something like state plane coordinate system feet, something a little bit more descriptive so I can just look at the file name and know what it is. The output coordinate system, I can pick that one from my favorites, my commonly used ones, or I could pick from projected state plane. We want the US feet and pick North Carolina from there, or I could import it from an existing layer that has what I want, and Bent Creek Roads and Boundary both have what I want. So I could double click that and you see US foot there. All right, click OK, and it's going to create a new feature class that is stored with new coordinates. So now if we go look in our catalog, notice project worked. See those meters down there? I need to refresh my database to show that one, but notice the coordinates now for this one. They're more like the, the other ones. Okay, so again, ArcMath will project on the fly if the layers are properly defined with coordinate systems, but a lot of times we want to create data that all are stored with the same coordinates. All right, so I'm going to make my streams blue again. I'm going to remove that one, and there we are. I'm going to save my map. All my data is pointing to uh, my database. Now, the next thing we want to look at is the hill shade. Now, this is important because at one of the last versions of ArcMap, the default loading of hill shades doesn't, doesn't display the way it should. I have not done an in-depth search to find out exactly why it's doing this, but I can show you how to fix it really quickly. So when you load the hill shade, it should not look like that by default. If we look at the properties of the hill shade by double clicking it, and we look at the symbology tab, you'll see it's showing unique values for every different cell, and there's a bunch of unique values. So what we want to do is not show unique values, we want to show it stretched with the hill with a grayscale, and that's all you do. That is how it used to come in by default. It's not doing that right now, but that's how you change it. And that looks more like a hill shade, okay, your shaded relief model. Now, as part of the first part of the assignment, we want to also clip 
this raster data set. Now, when you work with raster data, it's completely different than vector data. We talked about our two broad types of data models in GIS. We've got vector data, which has point signs and polygons and attributes that describe them, and we've been working almost exclusive, exclu exclusively with those this semester. But we also have this raster data model, and the raster data model and the vector data model are very different. Therefore, the tools you use to work with them are very different. These geoprocessing operations, none of these work with raster data. So when I tell you I want to clip this hill shade down to the boundary, you don't use that clip. If you look at the tools in our toolbox, the, the tools for working with raster data, many of them are under the spatial analyst tools, and some of them are under the geostatistical analyst tools. Spatial analyst is where we do most of them. And if you look at extraction, there is this extract by mask option. Extract by mask is how you clip a raster data based on a vector polygon. You'll hear me all the time say clip a raster, but it doesn't mean you use that same clip tool. It's actually a tool called extract by mask. So because the data models are so different, the tools that operate them on them are very different. So I'm going to clip this hill shade, extract by mask. The mask I'm going to use is the BC boundary, and I'm going to put this in my geodatabase. Remember, geodatabases can store raster and vector data. If, my, if I name something a little inconsistent to what I tell you to name it in the exercise, just roll with it. I'm not looking at the exact instructions every step through this. All right. Okay, so when I click OK, we let this thing roll. You can see it's working down there. And there, it worked. Now, notice this time, now I've got a hill shade stored in my database. And notice that it gave this grayscale ramp. This time it displayed it correctly, and if I turn off that, we'll see it, it did clip it. So I'm going to get rid of this too. Don't need it. All right, I'm going to save my map. So now I've got my data. I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing it down just to my project area. So every GIS project you work on, you, you start off with an area of interest or a study area, and you're working to get your data um, pared down to that area. All right. The final thing this week, or, or in, the, in the first part of the project, is to have you clean up some data. Um, actually, you're also supposed to uh, add the uh, other, the, you're supposed to use add XY data to add the Bent Creek openings. Okay, so this is a text file that has some coordinates. Now, this will be the third time y'all have done this this semester where you took a, take a file of coordinates and you generate points from it. Notice these coordinates are in latitude and longitude. They are in a, a lat long. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click that layer and we're going to tell it to display XY data. It's smart enough to realize the X and the Y field because of how I named them. Now what's important is the output, co the coordinates of this thing. The coordinates of this are not state plane. And this is where a lot of people run into problems. They think they want it to be in state plane so they tell it it's state plane. Those coordinates are latitude and longitude. So you need to tell it their latitude and longitude. So I'm going to edit this. Latitude and longitude are a geographic coordinate system. We're going to go with the world WGS84. In the exercise, that is what I also tell you to pick. There's other options that you might could use, and you need to get that from the source of the data. So. Since this data frame is in state plane, when I click OK to this, those project on the fly to match state plane. 
even though they're stored in lat long, I told it it's geographic so it can move it to these coordinates. So what we want to do now is we want to take this event layer and we want to export it to our database. And in this case, while we export it, we could project it to take on the coordinates of the data frame. So when you export a layer out of ArcMap that has been projected on the fly to match a different set of coordinates, during the export, you can actually have it project. So that's what we're doing here. And let's uh, call it Bent Creek Openings. All right, click OK. Yes. Now I'm going to remove this. I'm going to remove this. And we've got all this data stored in our database. We've just been building out our database for this project. Now, the, the submission, submission for this, when you go to submit, we want you to delete any source files out of your project folder. So, if you look at your shape files folder, and I'll view it a little bit differently, you can see there's some pretty big files in here. Our original streams data, it's a big file. We don't need that anymore. We don't need the streams for the whole state. We've clipped them down and put them in our database. So you can get rid of all of these shape files. In reality, in most projects, you end up leaving those shape files in there in case you did something wrong, you can have easy access to them again. But for your submission to me, I want you to get rid of all of them. Also, the elevation data. This is pretty big files in here. That hill shade you clipped down and you had the output go to the database. So you can get rid of that too. Okay, so make sure and clean up all the data that you don't need and it's not in your map anymore. So again, look at the list by source in your table of contents and you can see in my GDB here, I've got all this stuff so I don't need all those shape files. All right, I'm gonna save my map and we're gonna move right in to part two here real quick. Now, depending on the class you're in, the day seated classes submit work through each part. The online class does parts one through three and then submits. So if you're in the online class, you'll be moving right along into doing this part. So let's look at our georeferencing and talk about how this works. There's some instructions in the map I mean, in the, in the assignment for how this works, but I'm just going to walk you through it and talk about it as I go. All right. So the Bent Creek map, remember this map from the Forest Service? I'm dying to have a digital trails layer of my own so I can make my own map. And I know that there is this Forest Service trail map out there. It's a JPEG. So I'm going to load this JPEG into ArcMap and try to trace these trails. The problem is this JPEG does not have coordinates stored with it. It's literally a paper map that I picked up at the trailhead and I scanned it using a scanner. It has no spatial awareness to it. So you can load JPEGs directly into ArcMap regardless though. So I'm going to click the Add Data button and I'm going to go find this map, USFS Trail Map. Now you don't want to double click it because it'll show you the three bands that make up a color image on a computer, red, green, and blue. You want to just select it and click Add. And it comes up and says, hey, this layer does not have spatial reference information. Okay, so sure, that's what I've been telling you. It's just a JPEG. So where in the world is it? If I go over here and I zoom to all the data to the full extent, You'll see, you can barely see it. Where is it? It's right there. It's down here near the origin. It should be down here close to zero, zero. Okay? And this is our data up here that has the state plane coordinates. You can see the coordinates change. So it's just a long way away. So when you georeference, let's zoom into our boundary. 
what we're going to do is we're going to move that trail map up to where it has these coordinates. There's a toolbar that helps us with this called the georeferencing toolbar. And it will georeference any raster data. You want to be careful because our hillshade is raster data. You want to make sure you've got the trail map chosen in the dropdown. And what we're going to do is we're going to tell it to fit to our current display. We're going to move the map up to here where we're displaying Bent Creek in state plane coordinates. When I fit it to the display, wow, it came pretty close to going right in the right place. Now, you can change the color of things if it makes it easier to see where you are, but you can see it's a little bit off. See how the boundary in the scanned image is green and it's not in this? Now, if it, if it completely messes up, you can reset your transformation and move it back to where it was. I just luckily was zoomed in to an extent that it came in real close. I'm going to zoom out to show you what happens normally. You usually fit it to display, and it doesn't fit quite as perfect. Okay? Now, I'm going to... Yeah, see, you can barely see the red Bent Creek boundary there for my my uh, vector data and so there's some tools on our georeferencing toolbar that allow us to like scale the map down or up so see how I'm making it closer now I can also move it so that so through using these tools I can shift it I can get it pretty close to where it goes, all right? Now, once it's close, you can establish control points that define the coordinates for your scanned map, all right? Now, the corner of this JPEG right there is this real-world coordinate, that red vector GIS data has coordinates associated with it. See the coordinates in the bottom right? We need to assign those real-world coordinates to this raster image. So, you do that using control points. So I'm going to go add a control point, and what you do is you start with the unknown and you go to the known. So the raster data, the scan trail map is the unknown. This point should actually be that point. It will not snap to the raster data and know that this is not a perfect science. Notice that this boundary is really thick. That has to do with the symbol, the symbol used to display it. So where do you click? Do you click on the outside here? Do you click on the inside here? I know how those symbols are generated. They're generated from the center point going out. And so you want to try and click in the middle. So I'm going to click in the middle of that green. That should be that. Notice it moves it over. So that's getting a lot closer. And let's go up here and look. Okay, so see these here? Now I'm going to say, well, I can see that that coordinate is that's that. So remember, start with the unknown. Start with the trail map. That is actually that. I don't want it to snap to the endpoint of that road. I don't want to snap to that. All right. Now, because of what we're georeferencing, we're georeferencing a United States Forest Service map that's a pretty accurate map. With just a couple of control points, you can get it in pretty close as long as you pick the right ones. Now, on the um, on the exercise, I show you. I tell you to use to go from the yellow the yellow uh, to the blue, see those little circles? You're not going to see the yellow and the blue. Those were just for me to put in the exercise so you could see where to click. Now, the georeferencing toolbar will allow you to look at your, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I must get rid of that. It will allow you to look at your links. Notice I just put in a third one by accident, and it should have messed up my map a little bit, so I'm going to delete that link, okay? So, 
This tells you the from source and the to source. The from source and the to source. And what you don't get is a good RMS error until you do four points. So in this case, you don't really need four points because this map is pretty well put in. But we're going to put in a couple more so we can get a better RMS error and discuss RMS error. So let's look around a little bit and see what we've got. Um, see where we could maybe tighten this up a little bit. It's actually really, really close. We could maybe put one here. We could move this up a little bit. So let's add a control point here just to, to uh, bump this up just a little bit from there to there. Notice that sometimes you'll do things that tell you it's going to warp it. So you might click OK to that and look and see how bad it warps it. That doesn't look like it. Nah, it looks like it messed up pretty good there. I don't like that point. I'm going to delete it again. All right, so here's one we can. This road should actually be over here a little bit. All right, that moved it a little bit. Now let's just find one more. Generally, you try to distribute your control points around the map. Notice that it, it's got this one a little tweaked here. And you also want to put control points in where 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 things uh where there's an intersection of different lines or points. For instance, um, it the this is not the best place to try to hit where along this line is along this line. You can that actually works okay in this case, but it, it's better where roads come together, where you've got an intersection of lines. So let's add one last one here. If it's snapping to something it shouldn't, hold down your space bar. I'm going to say that that is actually that intersection. All right. So notice my RMS error now is 39. That's 39 feet, and that's not the error of the distance on the ground. What that is, is the difference in where you clicked and where it actually went. So it's 39 feet difference from where I clicked and, and where it ended up. That's not to say it's 39 feet actually on the ground. 39 feet is pretty good for something like this from a trail map. So once you get it to something you're happy with, and it looks like it's, you know, this map's pretty well on, on target now. If you get anything below 60 even for your first time, that's probably fine. When you finish and you're happy with it, you do what's called update georeferencing. What that does is that builds a world file. So if we look in our folder that stores our Bent Creek trail map, notice there's these other files now. That JGWX is a world file that stores the coordinates for that JPEG. Notice it's named the same thing. So now when you look at that JPEG, that file makes it georeferenced. It stores the coordinates for that image based on our georeferencing process. It's called a world file. ArcMap, when you go to add this data in, notice if I insert a new data frame and I go to add my Bent Creek Trail Map, notice you don't see these two other files. There are kind of hidden files that ArcMap uses to display this in real world coordinates. Notice the coordinates in the bottom right. This data is now georeferenced. The coordinates are not stored with embedded in the JPEG like a shapefile has coordinates stored in the J in the shapefile. The DEM, the coordinates are stored in the data format. What a world file does is it stores the the projection coordinate information for a raster data set in a separate file. And ArcMap reads that file and displays it where it, where it needs to go. Okay, So that's georeferencing. If you completely hose the georeferencing, you should reset your georeferencing here. And if that doesn't work, you can come in to this fol folder where your JPEG is and delete the other files. Sometimes you have to go in and strip away those additional files that get created to, to set it back to its original, to georeference. So 
But if you mess things up, a lot of times you have to you have to get rid of all of that stuff. All right. Now, that's the georeferencing part. From there, we're able to digitize these trails, and if we digitize the trails, the trails will be stored with these coordinates that the JPEG has now. Before we do that, we need to create a feature class in our Geo database to store the trails information. Now, the instructions have us do this, and I'm going to do most of it here. So, this is part three for creating a feature class in domains. Before you can create a trails layer, you need a trails feature class to store the trails data. So I'm going to go into my catalog window here, and in my database, I need to create a trails feature class. So I'm going to right click, and I'm going to say new feature class. I'm going to call this new feature class trails new feature class trails. I need to make sure to change it from the default feature type of polygon to line, because they're going to store lines. I need to tell it to be NAD state plane feet, just like the rest of my data. Take the default XY tolerance, take the default configuration keyword, and then I can put in some fields. Now, this feature class, I want to store the trail number, the trail name, the mileage, the rating, and the trail use. And in the exercise, I tell you to do all these things. The first of these, the, all four of these are going to be text fields. So trail name, text, trail number, text. Why is trail number a text field? Trail numbers are not anything we're going to ever want to add together or look at the average of. And in addition to that, if you look over here, you'll see some of the trail numbers are have an A in them, 326A. If you made it in a number field, you couldn't put a letter in it. Trail use, text, and trail rating. All right. Now, I just created a blank shell of a trails feature class that I can digitize in now and I've got some attributes I can add as I digitize in the trails. Now this is where we're going to see some advanced functionality of the geo database and a great reason to use a geo database because our trail use and our trail rating only have a few values that are possible. For trail use it's either going to be hike only it can be hike bike or it can be hike bike horse. Out there in the trails they can be used for just hiking or you can ride a bike on them or you can also take a horse on them. So when we get to trail use, wouldn't it be nice if you could have a drop down that had each one of those in it instead of having to type it in every time. The same with rating, easy, medium, easy, medium. They're all easy or medium. There's no difficult. But we're going to put a difficult just in case we come across one. So how do you make drop-down list? A drop-down list in a database is referred to as a domain. It's a property of the database. You do it at the database level and then you apply it to the feature class you want to. So I'm going to do one of them. I'm going to do one for trail rating. So I'm going to right click my database and go to properties and notice there's a domains tab. The domain name is going to be trail rating. This is the trail rating. The domain type, you can you have to make the domain type the same as the field you're going to apply it to. Remember all our fields were text. So for the code, I'm going to say easy the description moderate or medium difficult difficult 
most difficult. So domains make it make data entry faster and more consistent. So someone doesn't put in instead of medium, they put in moderate. Okay, so it keeps your data entry consistent. <coughs> now that we've got that domain built, I can go to my trails feature class properties, I can look at the fields tab, and I have to apply it to this trail rating field. Notice my trail rating field has a domain property, and I can choose that property from it. So you're going to do the same thing for trail use, and now with my trails are in the wrong feature class there. Let's go back up here and put it in here and let's remove this data frame. I forgot I had two data frames in there. Now notice I, I don't have any data in this trails feature class. But what I can do is I could go in and I can symbolize it based on that trail rating or trail use. And then I could enter all these in I should have done trail use probably because that's a better thing to enter it in as. That's how we like to symbolize it by trail use. The black lines are hike only, the blue lines are hike bike, and the red lines are hike bike horse. So, but uh, it's okay to do it just as a demonstration here. So I'm going to start editing. And make sure that my editing window is here, my create features window. And I'm going to put in an easy trail first. Notice these are symbolized differently, but that's okay. And I'm just going to digitize it in here. And I'm not doing a very good job. Double click. There's my trail. Now notice that trail, part of it's 33 and part of it's 35. It, it gets difficult looking at this map to determine which trail number is is which trail. And in the instructions, I tell you to do things like um, digitize up trail 335 until it hits another trail and then go up a different trail. If you have a problem telling which one's which, that's not a huge deal for this exercise. You can ask me what to do, or you can just make the best guess you can. If there was no one to ask and you were doing this in the real world, you'd need to go out in the field and look at it and figure out what's right. So in this case, the actual editing part here is actually the next exercise, the next part of this, part four. Parts two and three just have you georeference the data and then create a trails feature class in your domains. I just wanted to digitize in one line to show you how the domain works it makes it where you can choose one and it makes it easier to add the data and it uh, also um, keeps people from putting in weird different values it makes it consistent all right okay make sure and save your map along the way you don't have to edit this time um, but I wanted to quickly show you that all right that's what I got